So, Alex, um, as far as I'm concerned, um, you are one of the ultimate legends of this football club. Um, you may not have won the treble. Um, you may not have won, you know, all the individual honours the game can have. But nevertheless, you grew up in Moss Side. You've lived the dream. You've driven the um, city and the community forward. Uh, you've been rewarded quite correctly with an MPE. And now it's all over. I mean, where, how do you look back on your achievements and the high standard that you are held by by all City fans? Um, it seems as though it's gone quite quick, to be honest. 33 years with the foundation and then 12 years prior to that as a player. Uh, it was just a privilege to play for the club I supported as a boy, being a Moss Side boy as well, uh, Black Afro-Caribbean, you know, added spice to my story. Um, and then after a short, uh, successful career, uh, through injury, I finished and fell into the community work, which had I, uh, you know, had the opportunity to write my own job description and come up with my perfect job, that would have been it. You obviously grew up, as you say, in Moss Side. What were your parents' reaction when you started to emerge as this sort of talent? Because they must have known that you, you had an exceptional talent when you were a kid. They did, but they didn't understand the football system, which helped me really, because to them, Manchester City was just probably a local town football club. They didn't realise it was a top professional club. And that was good in the respect that they didn't pressurise me. They didn't, you know, I, I've worked in academies and seen how some parents can pressurise their, their own children, but that didn't happen for me. And that really helped me. I could just go, I was relaxed. I had a great youth coach with Steve Fleet, former Man City goalkeeper, to uh, understudy to the great Bert Troutman. And we had a great relationship. How did you end up being a goalkeeper? Was that just because you were brave throwing yourself around? Um, a little bit of both, really. Brave. I was quite agile. You know, I was always um, very athletic, great reflexes. So it just seemed to fit the bill with my sort of strengths, really. I, I did play outfield as a child as well. I always fancied myself as a bit of a striker, as all young kids do. But, uh, you know, the goalkeeping thing, I found quite easy and fell into it quite quite well. At the beginning of your career, the world was very different than it is now. And it's it's a sad reflection, really, that racism was far more predominant. What what was that like for you growing up? Did, did you suffer from that a lot? Yeah, I did as a child. Uh, my first encounter was walking into a local chip shop in Levenshume and there was a chap there who looked like he had a skirt on and he was saying things to me which I didn't understand. And when I picked my bag of chips up, the woman served he was red-faced and it was only later on in life I realised uh, he was a Scotsman with a kilt on, you know, and it, I, I'm not talking for all Scots people, of course, but, uh, you know, he was saying strange things to me about you know, you don't see many black people with a kilt on, do you? And that's when I realised it wasn't a dress, it was a, a kilt. <laughs> How did you deal with that? I mean, that, that that I can't imagine what it must be like because obviously I've not been through it. Yeah, it was. I was only a kid, so I didn't understand it. And, you know, there is good and bad in everybody. So, you know, I'm not for any uh, reason singling out anybody from a particular part of the UK. You know, you can walk into your local shop and, and get abuse. And even now, you know, sometimes I get some strange looks off people. But um, most people now know me, especially locally. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's got a lot better, but there still needs to be work in that area. The, the great Bernard Holford, who was the club's general secretary for so many years, was known by many people, including me, as Mr Manchester City. And these days, that's a title I would definitely give you for everything that you've you've done. Um, but obviously, you went through a different process than he did. He was always behind the scenes and you're out there, you were a player. Um, and I, I just wonder when eventually the moment came that you got the the chance to represent the club that you'd supported, your local club. What was like that like for you and just as importantly for your family? Yeah, it was great. I mean, uh, John Bond was the manager at the time, March 1981. I got the nod just about two hours before kickoff. Um, that I would be playing. And uh, it helped me in the respect that I didn't have time to really think about it. I thought overnight that I might play, but until you actually know. Um, so that did help me. You know, I, I, I didn't have time to get worried. It was just a case of going out. And, you know, with all due respect, it is just another match, even though it's in front of probably 45,000 people. Was your mum there, your dad there? 
Um, I didn't know at the time because I told them I didn't want them to go because it might have made me nervous knowing they were in the, the stand. And uh, my dad was a, a really big, strong chap. He's six foot five and he'd always had labouring jobs, lifting and carrying, so he was quite muscly. And um, he, he, he wouldn't tolerate any critique or racism. And uh, I thought, I don't really want him there because if somebody shouts something, if I make a mistake, you know, I could see my dad sort of in my mind jumping up and challenging the person who said something and I just didn't need that added pressure. It must have been great after the game. That Presumably you met up with them after the game and I, I'm just imagining the face, you know, the, your mum's face particularly. What, what does your mum look like when she's just seen you play? And yeah, then I realise this city's a big deal. Yeah, I think they were both very proud. Uh, my dad used to work at Walls, I think, in the time in uh, just outside Middleton, I think he was, um, or Hyde, sorry. And... Uh, when he went into work, I think that's when it really hit him when all his mates were saying, oh, was that your son? Um, but on the day, it was great. Um, I think I actually won man of the match as well. And it was presented in the old sort of players lounge. And that's when I first realised they were at the game because I think Joe Corrigan had actually got them in there. He didn't even know they were there at all till afterwards. No, no. But as I said, that was quite a good thing because I would have been a bit worried or nervous knowing they were in the stand. So once you start playing and you become a, a regular, um, I mean, we could go through your whole career, but what are the, I suppose, the highs and the lows of the games that people who are City fans will have in their minds anyway? Yeah. And within a year or two of each other, didn't they? Yeah, they were. Um, roughly two years, about the same time at the end of the season. In those days, City always were dramatic at the end of the season, a la... QPR with Aguero, but uh, the first one, of course, was Luton Town, where we were relegated, uh, Radiantish goal. Um, that was a really bad day and a tough day for us to take because I think that season we hadn't been uh, in the bottom three at any stage and we only actually fell into it after the Luton Town game. Uh, Radiantish scored the goal and he went on to manage Real Madrid, Atletico Madrid and Barcelona, so he did well out of putting a, a ball past me. But it was nice to be ever present two years later, play all 42 league games, and we beat Charlton Athletic 5-1 to go up on goal difference. So in my own mind, I felt if anybody wanted to point the finger, then I sort of rectified it by being uh, in the team two years later. But to be fair, the City fans were great with me. I never had an issue. I play bowls a little bit at the moment. When I have a bad day, I do actually think about it. I've even dreamed about it. I'm not yeah. saying it had a bad day, by the way, against Luton. Yeah. But yeah. that Radiantish goal, did he yeah. hold him for a while or did he just move on from it? No, I moved straight on. I did talk to Kevin Bond after the match. And Kevin, a ball came over and I punched it clear. And as he bounced at the feet of Radiantish, he hit it on what we call the half volley. So as the ball touches the ground, he strikes it at the same time. And if you do it perfectly, you get a fantastic clean strike. And he went right in the corner and I got my fingers to it. And Kevin Bond said, if I hadn't have touched it, it was coming straight to him. But I'd seen Kevin Bond's touch in training and I wouldn't have wanted to leave it. <laughs> I'm only joking, Kevin, if you <laughs> Sadly, you, your career came to a premature end, a bit like my great hero, Colin Bell. You didn't, you, you couldn't play on as long as you would have wanted, we would have wanted. Um, well, that must have been tough to take, I presume, when that happens. It was, but ironically, I knew... Prior to announcing it, I probably would never play a top flight again. I had um, part of my disc removed, uh, the base of my spine, and it damaged the sciatica in my right leg quite badly. I let it get too bad. So I always knew I would struggle to get back to full fitness. So in my own mind, I just thought, get as fit as you can, try and have uh, as much as a normal life. And if I do get to play some type of football, that's a bonus. So that's all I was thinking. But I carried on for 18 months. I left and went to Port Vale. And I wasn't getting any better at one point. And I just thought, you know, I'm not being fair to myself, not being fair to the Port Vale fans and the players I'm playing with. And I actually just uh, went in the next day to see John Rudge at the time, who was the manager, and said uh, that was it. Very typically magnanimous of you. Um, what, what's the next thing that you think then? Do you think, I'm going to create my own job for me, my dream job, and create this city in the community over the top of the shop at, at the old main road? How, how did that happen? Were you just in the right place at the right time? 
I was um, just about that time. Gordon Taylor and Mickey Burns, a former player, both at the PFA, did some research work around football clubs, and they found, other than match days, clearly there was no interaction with local community. So they set up six pilot clubs in the northwest, of which we were one of them. Uh, initially, the very early days, Kevin Glendon. Um, manage uh, football in the community at City, but he quickly moved on to become the manager at Radcliffe Borough Football Club, which at the time I think was either owned by Bernard Manning and managed by his son. And then um, they interviewed and Bernard said, well, the type of person would be Alex Williams. So I interviewed him and got the job. What, what was it like at the beginning? Because I should imagine what it was like back in those days and what it's like now as you move on and retire is very, very different. Absolutely. I think there was about four full-time staff at the time. Turnover was about 10 grand a year. Um, now we've gone to over 120 staff with a turnover of 3.5 million. Uh, in the early days, we had a rickety old Peugeot minibus because we had a connection with Peugeot. And it wasn't Peugeot's fault, but because Man City had no money, uh, the van was rack and ruin. And I was driving it to a school one day and got pulled by the police. And I got six points because all the tyres were bald on the minibus. <laughs> How different it is now. Um, yeah. I mean, you've steered the ship through this amazing journey. We as fans have watched the club change as well. I mean, how, how do you feel about your your journey? Is just It's a different version of our journey as fans, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I'm one of the few people from the inside. Uh, you know, Resty saw Bernard Holford would have been another one. Probably someone like Danny Wilson has been there a while now. Not many others. And to see the transition is amazing. Uh, I always thought it would happen. I, I, many years ago, I used to always say to people, wouldn't it be great if we had some owners or, you know, uh, the club could transition and be as good as its community scheme? And to be fair, <laughs> they've probably done that and some over the last sort of 10, 12 years. What, what would you say has made you the most proud in your life, Alex? could be anything. Um, I would say the amount of lives we have changed for the better through City and the community um, some of the stories I hear about, you know, a, a young lad, Jamie Trugaskis, who was a budding young city player, uh, got cancer in one leg, had an amputation and, you know, was considering uh, committing suicide and came along to one of our programmes and is now one of the best amputee footballers in the world playing for England. Uh, there are a million and one stories, uh, even just ordinary people. There's a young lad who uh, works on the security guard at the main entrance of the club. Many years ago, we used to do after school park sessions and it was a, a bit of a scally, the kid actually. He was only about 14 at the time. He's now working full time for the club as a security officer. Uh, he's got a wife and kids and he says he owes that to CITC changing his life. I could go on for hours, you know, male, female. Mike Green, who's a CEO at Lommel in Belgium, started off as a volunteer. Mike Geary, the current head of the foundation, likewise. Um, and there's, there's a million of one stories, but that that's the thing I'm proudest of most of all is people say how much CITC and through my direction has helped to change people's life for the better. You feel blessed? Um, I feel blessed in the fact I was given the opportunity to do the job um, because... I've always had a great rapport with people and the fans in particular. Uh, and I think one of the things most people will say about me is I will say hello and talk to anybody. I don't care whether it's, you know, Mr. Ferran Soriano, the global CEO, or whether it's, with all due respect, one of the cleaners sweeping the stand. I'll just stop and chat to anyone. And I think that's what people like about me. I don't pretend to be anything or anybody. I'm just a local lad myself. You've got an MBA. Who, who yeah. gave that? I mean, that obviously well done, but yeah. who presented that to you? Uh, well, at the time, it was his Royal Highness Prince Charles. But now when I speak to young people at schools and colleges, I can actually say I received it from King Charles III, which is uh, gets me a real brownie point with uh, the kids. Brilliant, brilliant. And you've now, along with Andy Buckley, former boss of mine, um, put together your life story. Uh, yeah. Was was that cathartic? I mean, what what was the reason you did that? Just to sort of close <laughs> literally the chapter on your career? Uh, no, I did it because it was locked down at the time and I did an initial draft and my sort of uh, grammar and spelling is very average at best. And I did it as a challenge to myself, first and foremost, um, but one or two people read it. And there's a lot of things people don't know about me. 
because I don't tell anybody anything. You know, uh, at one stage I was two mornings a week going to Everton coaching potentially the one of the top three goalkeepers in the world, Neville Southall, because he'd heard about my goalkeeper training. Alan Hodgkinson, uh, his goalkeeping coach at Sheffield United and my former goalkeeping coach at City had a knee operation and he loved it that much. Howard Kendall offered me a three-year contract but I couldn't leave Man City and the job went to Chris Woods, the ex-Norwich and England goalkeeper. Um, you know, the fact I've worked with Casper Schmeichel, Wayne Hennessy, um, Kieran Westwood, Republic of Ireland, you know, that I was their goalkeeper coach along uh, with Andy Rhodes and Dave Felgate. You know, the three of us did a great job, but I played a big part of that, especially the goalkeeping because when I was working with Casper, stood on the side watching everything I did was probably the greatest Premier League goalkeeper of all time, Peter Schmeichel. So how's that for pressure for you? Absolutely. Well, it sounds terrific. What's it called? How do we get it? Uh, it's called You Saw Me Standing Alone. And I believe if you go on www. Uh, alexwilliamsbook.com you can get the details from that or I think there's stuff on the club website or you know you can contact me easily enough still through Manchester City I'm sure if you contact the club they'll uh, you know give you the details Brilliant, I'll let you into a little secret now. During lockdown, I wrote my story. Now, I'm not as famous as you, but I actually did write my own life story and I thought, if I never publish it, at least my sons can read it yeah. and they yeah. can find out all these little nuggets like you've just described that they perhaps don't know about. So it is cathartic, that's for sure. Yeah, I'm sure you've got uh, some really exciting stories to tell as well. Some of the people you'll have come across, uh, players, current and former players, um, and people want to read about those things. So mine's obviously a different slant because what I'm trying to say in the book is, you know, people have issues today around racism in society, not just in football. You've got homophobia, you know, you've got um, people's um, nationality, their religion, sexuality, et cetera, et cetera. And really what my story is saying is if you think, especially around racism, things are bad today, read what happened to me and you'll be shocked. Uh, I saw a City fan just recently, won't be the only one, um, committed suicide through bad mental health. And mental health yeah. is another thing, isn't it? That's I, I guess you probably dealt with stuff like that during your career. Yeah, I mean, it's a massive thing at the moment through CITC. You know, our um, new strategy is using the power of football to address health issues. So, you know, we are trying to improve uh, healthy lives, healthy minds and healthy living of people within the area. So that's our new strategy with CITC. And we find using the badge and the, the brand of football is a great way to unlocking people and, and getting them to talk, which is the main thing, especially with males. Males do find it very difficult to talk about mental health because it's almost seen as a weakness and it's not everybody at some point has issues. I've got two more questions to ask you, Alex. Uh, not that that draws the line, because obviously uh, you're going to be around. I know that. That's yeah. one of the questions which I'll come to in a second. But I've got to ask you, you presented a trophy on the pitch at the yeah. Etihad to the first, the current first team, the amazing current first team. What on earth did that feel like? Oh, it was amazing. Um, I think what was more amazing was, well, one, I actually gave one of the trophies to Early Harlan, which, you know, people would have paid millions for that. But I think it was the fact the club felt what I had contributed throughout the years was enough to nominate me to do that. That's what I was more pleased about because, you know, they can pick anybody. With all due respect, anybody can physically hand a trophy over, although it is a bit nerve-wracking, although I wasn't nervous. But it was the fact that the club recognised my contribution over the years and allowed me to do that. That's what I was most uh, pleased about. I can't think of anybody more deserving, Alex. Um, and I don't say that lightly. I mean, we are quite rightly put statues up of David Silver, Aguero and Vinny and who yeah. knows, maybe there'll be Harland and Pep up there. But yeah. although not everybody would think this way, certainly those who don't yeah. understand the club, I'd have no problem with a statue of Alex Williams outside that stadium as well because you are Mr Manchester City. Um I hope your retirement doesn't mean that you're just going to disappear, and I don't think you will. So just give us an idea now what the future is for you. Um, well, <laughs> recently I've been doing loads of podcasts, uh, TV interviews, uh, big radio interviews. So um, I've, I've got a little break coming up in Portugal. I'm not going to give dates out in case there's anybody listening, but uh, I'll have a little break in Portugal and then... Uh, 
Hopefully by the time I get back, things will have quietened down a little bit for me. I'm still working at the club on match days. I've got the book coming out, circulating around uh, official support clubs. So if I've not contacted you yet and you want me to come along, please give me a shout and I'll actually come along, sign the books in person. Um, the club do a lot of uh, corporate events around matches, which I'm involved with. So I'm still doing a lot. I'll probably still be working two days a week in and around the club anyway, but just not day to day. And we've got a great community scheme headed now by Mike Geary and uh, he's got a great leadership team and I'm sure they'll go onwards and upwards, especially while City continues to dominate on the field. Uh, Alex, I've known you since you were a player. I'm honoured to know you still. And um, thanks very much for your time. Uh, enjoy your semi-retirement. And yeah. um, isn't it great to be a Blue? It is, especially now when long may continue. <laughs>